Thank you very much. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes or no? Can you hear me up the back? Yes? Good. I always ask that question because I'm, as you heard, I'm hearing impaired myself. I'm actually a bionic woman. I have two cochlear implants. I'm going to take one of them off and show you. This is the product of Graham Clark's efforts, and you probably know Professor Graham Clark, um, very famous, particularly in Australia, because he, he believed that you could produce human language artificially, and nobody else believed him. But after a period of about 10 years, he um, was able to show that you actually could when you threaded an electrode into the cochlea of um, the human brain. So I can't hear anything except when I'm wearing my cochlea implants. So it just shows you what science can do in the space of 30 years. You can go from um, complete deafness to someone being able to do everything that you can do maybe even better, okay? All right, so I have a duality of interest to declare. This is important because perhaps everything I say might be in influenced by either an intellectual bias or a financial bias, all right? I have to declare the financial bias, but we don't usually declare intellectual bias, but if you ask me, it's much, much bigger. Our ideas, our own hypotheses, we cling to them, and we want to prove we're right. And that's a very, very strong um, stimulation for everything we do. Okay, all right. So you went through the Charles Perkins Center just the, today? Uh, some people have gone through. I think about half the group has gone through the CPC. Yeah. Half are waiting to do it tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, this building is the biggest footprint in the University of Sydney. It holds 800 people, and its mission... Its mission is real-world solutions to real-world problems. And those problems are centred on obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I'm going to just stick to obesity and diabetes today because it's such a big area and they're connected so closely. All right. I know some of you are from countries other than Australia. I know some of you... It's 3 o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> I have that message on my computer to remind me. Are you seeing the cursor? No. Oh, yes, you are. Um, to remind me to breathe and to get up and to walk around because that's important. Every nation is getting fatter, all right? Even um, those who start off from a very low base like Korea are still going up at much the same rate same pace as other countries. So the USA, I know some of you are from there, they take the cake at the moment and having the most people that are um, proportion of overweight. The UK comes second. But what I wanted you to notice in particular, that Australia started from a low base um, in 1990, but you can see we've actually crossed over we've gone up at a faster pace than any other country. And the question is, why? Why? <laughs> and you know what? I think it's because we've been trying very, very hard to do what we thought was the right thing. Okay? And I'll let you see what I think as we go on. Okay, it's the same no matter how educated you are. So, yes, this is American data, but you can see, you know, that college-educated people are less likely to be overweight or obese as measured by their body mass index. But what you should notice is that whatever's causing this problem it's going up at the same rate in every group, every socioeconomic group, from the least educated to the most educated. So the problem is not solved by education. Okay? A lot of people think it will be. 
Well, it might reduce it, but the fact is it doesn't explain why we've been going up and up and up. All right, some rude facts about Australians. Um, if you're over the age of 18, two out of three adult males is overweight or obese. Stunning, isn't it? But what about, look at your dad, all right? <laughs> Are you, is your dad overweight? Yes? What happens is you're, you're at an age where you're still quite active, okay? You're not forced to be sedentary for so much of the day. Well, not usually. <laughs> um, so, so you're more likely to expend the energy you eat, but as you get older, your appetite is slightly slightly higher than what you need and it happens to females too but we're a bit more conscious of our weight and we probably make some more um, disciplined decisions about um, what we eat and what we do um, in the way of exercise. One in four of us have pre-diabetes and pre-diabetes is, a, is a, a window in time where if you do something about it you can reverse the symptoms of prediabetes, reverse the signs, and you can actually prevent diabetes if you act during this window. All right, and for most people, that window is in a, between about 40 and 50 years of age. All right, even our children, even the two year olds, the two year olds, the ones that run around like little nutcases, even two out of, one out of five of them is overweight or obese. And that's stunning, isn't it? Because, you know, they haven't had long in their exposure to environmental circumstances that um, encourage obesity. They're still pretty active. They're not sitting there drinking soft drink all the time. So why are our children overweight and obese? Well, one of the really flourishing areas of research at the moment is that obesity starts at conception. It starts perhaps even before conception, all right? And you might find that stunning, but what we're learning is, is that the mother's weight at conception, the mother's weight gain during pregnancy, too much or too little, and whether she develops a condition called gestational diabetes. They, those three factors, will determine the chances of her child being overweight and obese and later being susceptible to diabetes. So if we want to do something about our problem, we have to start really, really early. We have to start with people like you. Okay? What it's, what it's showing it is, is that it's one of the highest risk factors. So there are all these risk factors, okay? So in terms of the, the chance that it multiplies the risk, these are really important ones. So, so for example, if the mother is overweight or obese, you might have five times the risk, all right, of having an overweight child. If the mother has gestational diabetes and it's not treated, then you've probably got 10 times the risk. All right, other factors are involved, but this is absolute clear-cut science. All right, yeah, really clear-cut. But like everything, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a risk, it's a proportion. It doesn't say you must, all right? Okay, so obesity and diabetes, they go hand in hand. And we are still learning why they go hand in hand. And um, I'm not going to go into mechanisms today. I'm just going to say how big the problem is of diabetes. It is so big. You can see there the totals, um, more in Asia than everywhere else. But the total world population of people with diabetes is 382 million. Of approximately half don't know they have diabetes. So people of a certain age should be asking their GP to check their blood glucose at every visit, or at least once a year. 
So if diabetes was a country, it would be the third most populous country on the planet after China and India. And it costs a lot of money. Just in Australia alone, 15 billion bucks a year. All right? A lot of money. Um, and, you know, we, there's a lot of other good reasons to spend money, um, like education, like universities and schools. Can I get you, I know, I know you want to ask a lot of questions, but I've got a lot of slides. And what I want to do is get through them as fast as possible. So will you write down your questions for me? Is that okay? Write them down so you don't forget them. So, so it's important to um, do something about this big problem. All right. Before I go further, I want to explain to you a little about why a high blood glucose, which is also called a high blood sugar, but the, the proper word is glucose because that's the, the sugar that's in the bloodstream, high blood glucose. All right. When we're talking about blood glucose, the word we use is glycemia. So glycemia can be high or low. And you've probably heard words like hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, which means a very low blood sugar level. So it comes into people's um, vocabulary because of things like sport. Okay, the hormone that brings blood glucose down is insulin. And insulin is also a master hormone that controls a lot of the activity um, in metabolism because it's an anabolic hormone. And it, it has, there are limits of, to the body's ability to produce insulin. Some of us are born without the capacity to produce huge amounts of insulin for the whole of life. And many of us will develop diabetes because we lack that capacity. But what I want to show in this slide is why glucose is harmful. When it's in the blood, High glucose levels will cause oxidative stress. It means that the cell is trying to um, mop up all these free radicals that are being formed by the metabolism of glucose in the mitochondria, in the mitochondrial chain. So those, those oxygen free radicals, if they are unrestrained, they're not being mopped up as adequately as they should, it causes inflammation and inflammation is the basis for many diseases. Um, it causes endothelial dysfunction, which is a word that means that your, your blood vessels um, are not flexing and pulsing the way they should. So it spells trouble for your blood vessels and hearts. Um, coagulation and fibrinolysis affected by um, high blood glucose levels, you're more likely to form a clot and that clot will take longer to break down. And your beta cells, the cells that produce insulin, are probably the most vulnerable cells in the body to this oxidative stress. Because after all, they're a glucose um, meter. They're your, your body's glucose sensor. And they're particularly susceptible so if you don't treat them properly, in the end they're dying at a greater rate than they're being formed. And so your beta cell mass is contracting. And what you also do if glucose levels is high, are high, you find that your proteins become glycated. Any protein throughout the body becomes glycated. And when they do that, they're called at the end stage, they're called end, advanced glycated end products. And that just happens to spell age. And so age really is a process of being glycated. Even your wrinkles, or my wrinkles, not yours, are actually advanced glycated end products in um, the skin itself. But the brain and everything, all the tissues and organs are susceptible. So if you have diabetes and you're not looking after yourself, you have complications. You have heart attacks, you have strokes, you go blind, you go have kidney failure, renal failure, you have nerve damage. And because of the nerve damage, you're often not aware that you have um, um, knocked your toe or your foot and you end up with amputations. And I tell you, it happens every day to people with diabetes. It is, um, 
it's a terrible disease to have. So, the question I'm really getting at is, can we blame the food supply for obesity and diabetes? What do you guys think? I'll just have a sh show of hands. Who thinks that it's the food industry and the food supply? All right. Do you, that's about half of you, I think. Who thinks it's because we're, it's, we're just not active enough? We've slowed down, we're too sedentary. Yes. Some of, them, some of you are the same, I can tell. All right. Um, who thinks it's something in the water? Okay, all right. Who thinks it's an infectious disease? <laughs> well, don't, don't um, be too surprised, all right? Um, there are many serious studies suggesting it is an infection. So I've been around so long, I think, well, I, you know, don't completely um, dismiss those ideas. All right, so I'm going to stick to the food theme because I know it's best. I know it's best. Food is cheaper now than it's ever been in the whole history of human um, endeavor. So where is my cursor? There it is. So, as so you can see the pink line, that's the proportion of expenditure, household ex disposable income, disposable income that's on food. All right? We are very lucky. The food industry has done something that is truly amazing, make food cheaper and cheaper for us. And it includes the food we spend, um, the food that we um, buy at the supermarket and we eat at home, and that's the blue line. But the yellow line is the food we, um, the proportion that we spend on food away from home. And it's stayed fairly constant between 1970 and 2010. All right? So, a lot of people think it's fast food, and they think it's the composition of the fast food. All right? Okay, we do eat more calories every day. This is American data, and you can see in 1970, the, the calorie consumption was about 2,100, and here it's about 2,600, um, about an extra 500 calories a day. All right? But which, which came first? the chicken or the egg. So if I gain 20 kilos, will I need more food? Will I eat more food? Yes. Yes, I've got a bigger body, I've got more muscle to carry around, I'll need more food. So which came first? All right, it doesn't answer the question. That graphic doesn't tell us anything. All right. What if we look, as many people have, at the kind of food we're eating, all right? Is it the carbohydrates, the fat, or the protein? And we, again, we're looking at American data, but it's similar in any Western country. The bottom blue line is protein. It's barely changed in grams per person per day. The fat, it comes up here in about 2,000, a little bit. All right? But it hasn't changed a lot. But look at carbohydrates. We are definitely eating more food as carbohydrate than we ate um, before 1980. All right? So that, those extra calories, more of them come from carbohydrate. Okay? All right? And I can show you graphics like this, which show these beautiful correlations between carbohydrate intake, which is your blue column, your blue column, there we go, um, and obesity, which is your orange line. But you know what? This doesn't tell you anything either, because I could replace the blue columns with bottled water. Would that prove that bottled water caused obesity? No, and that's the problem. These, this is called cross-sectional data. It doesn't prove anything, all right? And yet, yet, we use this sort of data to imply things all, all the time. All right, we've been told to eat more carbohydrate and less fat, all right? 
I don't know whether you know that you probably do that the food we eat is made up of carbohydrate, fat and protein. All right? So if we're told to eat less fat, the, other, the calories have to come, the, the other calories have to come from somewhere. All right? Eat less fat, then more of our calories will come from carbohydrate. And we've done that. We've, we've actually, actually taken on board the message. Australians, more than any other country, took on board the message, eat less fat, and instead eat more carbohydrate. But it hasn't been a successful strategy to eat low-fat diets. And notice I say as a strategy, as a strategy to address our obesity epidemic. It has not been a successful strategy. I can show you in the lab, I can show you research studies, low-fat diets can work in certain situations. They do work. People lose weight on them. All right? But as a strategy and the public health level, no, nope, it's not done anything. And in some people, we might suggest quite reasonably that perhaps it had something to do with making it worse. Let me show you the longest, most expensive, um, biggest nutrition study ever done. It was called the Women's Health Initiative. And what they did was they took nearly 50,000 women all right, doesn't get any bigger than this. Um, 50,000 women, um, and they followed them up for nine years. For the first year, they had lots and lots of lifestyle intervention, it's called. They got lots of nutrition education, um, exercise um, advice, um, behavioral advice, they cause, call it, about you know eating um, when you're hungry and not when you aren't hungry. Um, and for the first year, they lost weight. But can you see what happened year by year by year? They regained the weight. Well, that's what happens in 95% of people. They regain the weight. Now, the advice they got, nutrition-wise, was eat a low-fat diet, eat more fruit and vegetables, eat more whole grains. Okay? Standard, conventional dietary advice but it didn't go, it didn't last, all right? So there's something in the brain that, that tells us to go back to um, the weight we were. All right, so the question was, they had lost weight and they did keep it off for a reasonable length of time. Did it make any difference to the risk of diabetes? A follow-up of nine years in people that had no diabetes to begin with, they're the two lines, the difference between the control and the intervention. There's absolutely no difference. Now, I could cover up that word diabetes and I could put cardiovascular disease. I could put heart attack. I could put stroke. I could put colon cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and the lines look the same. So in other words, those efforts to eat a low-fat diet and lose weight had no effect on long-term risk of chronic disease. And the data doesn't get any better than this. So that's why I said low-fat diets have not been a successful strategy to address our chronic disease. All right, so now, old nutrition, new nutrition? What do I mean? Old school nutrition and maybe this is what you've been taught. Foods can be dissected into macronutrients, just like I've been talking about, protein, carbohydrate, fat. Saturated fat is the main dietary risk factor for heart disease. All right, we've all been taught these. A low-fat diet is best for weight control. Eat a diet, therefore, that is low in fat and high in complex carbohydrate complex carbohydrate. Eat plenty of cereals, breads, rice, preferably whole grain. It doesn't have to be whole grain, but preferably. All right? Standard conventional nutrition advice. Eat less salt and limit added sugars. All right? And you know what? Australians have been very good about this Advice. Australians are, I think, quite unique um, people. 
we actually try to do the right thing. We have the highest rates of vaccination. We have the highest in the Western world. We have the highest rates of using safety um, seat belts. We have high rates of um, breastfeeding. Um, we do a lot of things without making them law. Okay? So, limit added sugars, what have we done? In Australia, sugar intake has been declining for the last 30 years. Over the same time period, obesity and, obesity and diabetes in Australia have tripled. All right? So, something to think about. So, if it's not sugar, what is it? We've been eating more carbohydrate. We've been eating more starch. All right. Oh, another graphic I only made just recently. It's not the soft drink. Everyone thinks it's soft drink. If it's not the sugars, it's soft drink itself. And this data comes from the latest Nutrition Health Survey in Australia, very up-to-date data, and you can see that the percentage of sugars that are consumed as soft drink is going down. All right, and one of the reasons is that our sugary soft drinks have less and less sugar in them. All right, some of them are mixtures like Pepsi Life. They're mixtures of sugar and stevia, an artificial sweetener. So Australians have been trying to do the right thing. Okay. So let's go back to this possibility that it is something to do with the carbohydrate. We can divide them into simple and complex carbohydrates, which means basically sugars versus starches. It could be the dietary fiber content is interesting and important. It could be that the extent of processing is important. For example, whole grains and refined grains. You know, most people would agree that refined grains are, are much easier to eat. They're much softer. You don't have to, you know, chew as long. You can swallow them faster. Um, and then there's this other attribute of carbohydrates called the glycemic index. All right? And that's where I want to spend about five minutes. And that's because it's my favorite subject, glycemic index. Can I ask who's heard of the glycemic index? Oh, that's nice to see. Who hasn't heard of the glycemic index or GI? Okay, really? All right. Okay, so just a quick rundown on what it is. Carbohydrates are the only constituents of foods that raise blood glucose. All right, if I give you olive oil or butter, nothing happens to your blood glucose. If I give you protein like cheese, um, protein and fat like cheese, nothing happens. If I give you starch or sugars, your blood glucose goes up. All right? And you find carbohydrate foods like bread and spaghetti everywhere. They're very common, cheap foods. But their speed of digestion varies. So some carbohydrates in some foods are digested more quickly than others. And it depends on the food itself and how the food is processed. All right? If it's on, on the whole, you can make a generalization that if it's less processed, then it's digested more slowly than if it's been um, puffed, popped, flaked, um, and everything else that the food industry tends to do to foods. All right? What's happening is that the starch molecule, its physical and chemical state is changing when we process starchy foods. So you can see down the bottom there that the glycemic index has changed from 54 to 84. So what's the glycemic index? Well, all it is is like a tape measure. It's a tool. It's for measuring the rate of, at which carbohydrate foods, the carbohydrate in different foods, raises the blood glucose levels. All right? So top of the, the tree is... Glucose itself, a glucose solution, raises glucose fastest, and so it has a glycemic index of 100. And we know the glycemic index of thousands of foods now. You can look them up on glycemicindex.com, which is a University of Sydney webpage. 
So what scientists like myself do, we categorize foods into high and low glycemic index. So the foods with a high glycemic index generally, all right, generally, are potatoes, white bread, wholemeal bread, garden variety wholemeal brown bread. It has the same GI as white bread. Most rices, like jasmine, most breakfast cereals, cornflakes, rice bubbles, sultana bran, most low-fat snacks, so think rice cakes and cruskets and other things that you think are good for you. They have a, a very high glycemic index. On the other hand, on the other side of the slide, you've got foods with a low GI and they have a score of 55 or less. So pasta and noodles are good. Legumes, star performers on the glycemic index scale, they rarely get above 50. Even baked beans, dairy foods, even ice cream. Most fruit and vegetables, with the exception of potatoes, have a high GI, sorry, have a low GI. And some rices, like basmati rice, which is the rice that Indian people prefer to eat, it has a completely different texture to jasmine rice. And it has a lower GI. And some breads and some breakfast cereals have a low GI, but I have to measure them to know. I can't look at them and say, oh, that'll be low and that'll be high. Even I can't do that. Because I don't know what's happened during food processing. And what really, really, um, I was going to say pissed off a lot of people is that the sugary foods were not the highest on the scale, all right? They tended to fall in the intermediate range. So something like a Mars bar has a glycemic index of 60, all right? It's not higher. It's not the highest. A soft drink has a GI of about 65. So there are lots and lots of starchy foods that are higher than sugary foods. All right, now I can use a device called a CGMS device. The CGMS device means Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. It's a patch and I can put this patch somewhere here on you and I can then determine what your glucose levels are for the next six days. All right, I can follow you. I can download the data when you're finished by taking, um, taking the information from the patch. And what you can see is that if I get you to eat a high glycemic index diet, your blood glucose will be higher across the day compared to those with a low glycemic index. All right? So basically what I've done is just like I do every day in our research, we encourage people to eat high GI on one arm or low GI on the other arm. And everything else in the diet should remain the same, the same fiber content, the same protein, fat, and total carbohydrates should remain the same. All right, and we do that research because we want to know whether glycemic index is important or not. Okay, so this is new nutrition. This is this is the landscape that currently exists in nutrition, that low-fat dietary advice hasn't been helpful, and that's because weight regain is very common. There's no reduction in the risk of chronic disease when the public health message is simply eat low-fat. All right, we should pay more attention to protein intake, and that's because of a wealth of studies around pro higher protein diets. Higher protein diets are more satiating, they make you feel fuller for longer protein, and they're better for weight control. And we should make, pay more attention to carbohydrate sources. All right, we should swap high GI carbs for low GI carbs. All right, and I'm going to show you some of the scientific evidence that says that this advice works. And we should all always be respectful of traditional cu cuisines. So, for example, the Mediterranean diet is full of fat. It is swimming in fat, all right? You have to eat four tablespoons of olive oil a day if you want to follow a, a Mediterranean diet. Would you find that easy? 
four tablespoons of olive oil. It's not easy. It's a lot higher than what you're used to. But to some people, it is normal and natural. And our Mediterranean diet has a huge body of evidence which says it's protective against heart disease, probably more so than any other diet. And of course, you have your traditional Asian diet. And some of those diets are associated with extremely long longevity, where people live to 100 or more. And they are very low-fat diets. Okay, so this is the advice that we currently give. And we're currently still, we're still giving, we're still doing the research, but the research questions are starting to look like we know the answers. There is a strong case for modestly higher protein intake. And I put modestly in there because I don't want you to think I'm advocating um, Atkins diet or a paleo diet. Um, I just want you to nudge the protein up. And that's because it's satiating, it increases thermogenesis, and thermogenesis is the, the sort of engine that's driving your whole body. Um, it's heat production. And if you drive up thermogenesis, you drive up um, energy expenditure. Weight control, something called HbA1c, which is your average glucose level, postprandial, which means post-meal glucose levels, and because it replaces the bad fats and it replaces the bad carbs, whatever they are, okay? But caution, very high-protein diets and very low-carb diets, the ones that you hear about in the press, so the Australian students might hear Pete Evans talking about his paleo diets and recommending um, bone broth for infants under one year of age as their source of formula. Well, be very, very sceptical. Okay, I want to show you a, what we call a forest plot. Have you ever seen a forest plot before? No? Well, when you get to, to science, and particularly nutrition, there's a lot of forest plots, and they are very, very boring. Some of them, people call them aeroplane plots, because they look like little aeroplanes. But basically, what it does is this, this is the, what you call a, a meta-analysis. And what it does is pull different studies from different people, pulls all the data together, and asks the question, if we have more data, is the effect now really strong and significant? And see that line in the middle, this line here? This line here is on zero. If all of the things fall to one side or the other side, it's telling you something. So all you have to see is be able to see that it's falling on the left. And what that tells you, it's the negative side. It's negative minus 10, minus 5. It's telling you that high-protein diets do help people lose weight. It does. And that applies in the long term, after a year, up to two years of age, two years, after two years later, people still have more weight loss on a high-protein diet. All right, there's also a good case that we can make for the same identical reasons for lowering GI and what we call the glycemic load of the diet. So the same reasons, thermogenesis, satiety, weight control, postprandial glycemia, replaces bad fats, replaces um, bad carbs. And unlike high-protein diets, there are no safety concerns related to low GI diets. So now we have a competition between scientists. Very normal, all right? That tension exists all the time. There are those who say high-protein diets are best, like CSIRO, and there are those, like myself, that say low GI diets are best. All right. Um, low GI diets have been shown to be associated with, particularly with maintenance of weight loss. And this is really, really important because remember 95% of people who lose weight regain it. And you can see there in the first six months they lost weight and in the next 12 months they maintained that weight loss perfectly. All right. So the name of the game is which diet is best for weight loss maintenance, all right? And that's the question that this study
published in 2011, tried to do, tried to answer. It's called the Diogene study. It cost 16 million euros to do. And what they did was compare high protein diets and low GI diets. And they compared it with the official dietary advice that's given in each country. All right. And what they ended up with was five diets. And what they did was get them to lose weight to begin with using those milkshake diets. So everyone in this study, and there were 800 of them, nearly 800 of them, they gained, they were all heavy, overweight people. They got them to lose 8% of their body weight, and then they randomized them to one of five diets. So the question was, which diet was associated with the best weight loss maintenance. And I think you can see that official dietary advice, which is this line that looks a bit green, um, official dietary advice was associated with immediate weight regain. All right? So was the control diet. So was the, sorry, the, the low-protein, high-GI diet, the high-protein, high-GI diet. The low-protein, low-GI diet, which started off well, but then they regained. But this diet with the red broken line was the combination of high-protein and low-GI. So it combined both concepts together and showed that there was something really, really good about both concepts together. So Diogenes proved that really a combined high-protein, low-GI diet was the way to go for weight loss maintenance. And then the next thing we asked, and we're still asking and still in the process of answering, is does that high-protein, low-GI diet prevent diabetes? All right? Remember I started by talking about the people with pre-diabetes? Well, we're asking, we're asking the question, can we prevent diabetes in these people that are very, very likely to develop diabetes in the next few years? So the aim of this big study is it's called the preview study, and one arm is here in Sydney. So we want to identify the most efficient lifestyle pattern for preventing diabetes. So we have a, what's called an RCT, which is called a randomized controlled trial. It's the gold standard of doing a study. All the drugs that we test and devices that we test are, are tested against a control and the control should receive just the same amount of professional attention as the intervention. So, in this study, we're comparing two diets, and the two diets are, I'll show you in a minute, and two exercise strategies for preventing diabetes. It will be the largest ever diabetes prevention study. And so it's made up of 15 partners around Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And eight of us are involved in that randomized control trial. And this is the team in Sydney. They're all next door in the Charles Perkins Center. And we have recruited nearly 200 subjects in Sydney, and the rest are recruited around the world. And we are working very, very hard to answer that question. Is the high-protein, low-GI diet um, the best diet for prevention of diabetes? All right, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes, two minutes, um, how to eat a high-protein, low-GI diet. This is just practical advice when you can take home. All right? So... What we want to do is eat approximately 100 grams of protein a day and 200 grams of carbs. Now, chances are, because most of you are coming from Western countries, that you already eat about 70 to 80 grams of protein. So you just need to modestly push it up, all right? Just a bit more meat, a bit more um, fish or eggs or poultry at lunch or dinner time, more more um, eggs at breakfast time. 
So roughly the ratio of protein to carbs is one to two. All right, so your nutrition plate looks like this. It's got green as your half the plate and it should be vegetables. All right, does your plate look like this at night? Is it half of it covered with vegetables? Um, half, uh, sorry, a quarter should be protein sources. I'll talk about them in a minute. And the other quarter should be your low GI carbs. Okay? So those vegetables on the green side, they're kind of low carbohydrate vegetables like carrots and, um, and um, green leafy vegetables, um, salad vegetables if you like. Okay? So, I want to give you a little test. Which one of these two pictures is the high protein, low GI? Uh, who, who says left? Who says right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I found, I'm afraid the left's one. All right, I'll tell you why. Might be a bit hard for you to see. See how there's more potatoes here? Potatoes are carbohydrates. See how there's some cornflakes? There's more carbohydrate. Um, see over here, um, there's nuts, which are high protein, high fat. Um, this is cheese. These are little prawns or shrimp. This is a piece of pork, there's eggs, there's more protein on this side. There's chickpeas, more soy proteins. In fact, in fact, the legumes have this perfect ratio of one to two for protein to carbohydrate. So legumes um, and dals made from them, um, chickpea dips and things like that, hummus, have this lovely perfect ratio. All right. So let's talk about the protein. If you want to choose a healthy, um, high-protein, low-GI diet, go for these sorts of proteins, protein foods. It includes the legumes, um, chicken, eggs, low-fat meat, and those, the things in the kidney dish, uh, kidney-shaped dish are, are legumes. They're dals. Um, sorry, they're lentils and fish. All right, dairy's good. Dairy is good, even high fat dairy is coming out good, high fat cheeses are coming out good. But everything in moderation until we know more. Butter, not butter. Butter is definitely associated with an increase in your, your risk of cardiovascular disease. But no to the things that um, you might think are good sources of protein. Things like salamis, yes they're high protein, but but not good from the point of view of reducing the risk of chronic disease. Okay, and that's because saturated fats increase your bad cholesterol levels. Choose Greek yogurts because Greek yogurts have a higher protein content. Um, in fact, they're, they're getting even higher lately and um, because the food industry is quite responsive to consumer demand and consumers are asking for more protein. Soy lin bread, which is one of our popular breads, well popular with women, not so popular with the men or the children, but it has the perfect ratio too, um, one to two, a ratio of one to two for protein to carbohydrate. Um, your beans and legumes, perfect ratios, and I know everyone is not, ex not everyone loves legumes, but if you think about it, most people will sit down to, to eat um, peanut butter on something. Peanut butter and celery as a snack is a good one. Um, think, think Indian dals um, and the dips that I mentioned before um, and baked beans. All right, Australian scientists came up using conventional breeding of potatoes. They came up with a low GI variety of potato. And it was launched about 18 months ago. It's sold exclusively at the moment through Coles. It's called Charisma. And it is a low GI potato. And the Americans are now buying it, um, buying the seeds and growing it. And soon you should see Charisma around the world. And it's an Australian, um, it's not invention, but an Australian discovery. 
We also have low GI rices on the market, um, and you can see that low GI cells, sustained energy it's called, and low GI barley max is um, um, a uh, discovery by CSIRO using conventional breeding techniques. They came up with a barley that's higher in protein and very low GI. And so they make breakfast cereals now with Barley Max. I don't know whether you've seen them on the market. Perhaps um, um, you, they're made by um, a company called Goodness Superfoods. They also make Barley Max flatbreads. And if you see them on the market, give them a try because I will guarantee you that you will feel, you will feel almost excessively full if you have that flatbread rather than normal flatbread. Okay, and there's some breakfast cereals already on the market which are low GI as well as high protein. Okay, we in Australia also came up with a Logi, um, Logi cane which is low GI sugar. Um, it's like wholemeal sugar if you like. What they did was um, they took out one of the naturally occurring components of the raw sugar. They concentrated it and sprayed it back on the starch and it actually lowers the, the rate of digestion of the sucrose um, in sugar cane. Um, and finally, making healthy choices. The University of Sydney, because of all our research, um, made the decision that they would trademark, um, produce a certified trademark of foods um, that were properly GI tested and also made a positive contribution to nutrition. Have any of you seen this trademark? Yes, some of you have, that's good. Well, it is a University of Sydney trademark. It shows that what the university can do. It's run by a spin-off company of the University of Sydney. It's a good example of how agribusiness and, and um, the food industry and the universities work together to make progress. CSIRO has a weight loss diet called a high protein, low GI diet at the moment. You can go online. Anyone can do it. You have to put down $150 to begin with, but you get it back at the end, um, whether you've lost the weight or not as long as you do what's requested each week, weigh yourself and put the numbers in online. So um, have a look. They also have a, a dietary score um, test at the moment. So if you've got five minutes to spare, go on to CSIRO diet score and put in, answer the questions, and it will give you your diet score out of 100 taking into account all the things we know about a good diet. Okay, so final slide, take home messages. Our obesity, diabetes epidemic is serious and it's everyone's business. The low fat strategy failed, let's try something else. The carbohydrate foods seem to be part of the problem, all right? Just, just one part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution. All right, carbohydrate foods taste nice. The solution is not to chuck them, all right, like they've done with Atkins and paleo diets. The idea is just to be choosy about the carbohydrate foods. So optimized carbohydrate intake means modestly more protein, modestly less carbohydrate, and lower GI. So, and um, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine thy food. So it's the advice I follow today. So thank you very much.